Um, Jan Piet Mainz is talking about Ansible, a simple configuration ma management tool for push pull deployments. Um, yeah, have fun. I hand over to you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Jan Piet or JP Mainz. I'm a consultant, a little bit of an architect, a system administrator, I do all sorts of stuff, and I enjoy um, things that work, for example, plain text and LDAP and DNS and MQTT and also Ansible. Um, before I start, uh, does everybody do system configuration via some tool like Puppet or Chef or Ansible? How many Puppet and Chef users? Okay, you can go and have lunch. No, just kidding. <laughs> you can't actually, lunch isn't ready, that's why. Um, I'm not here to try and convince you if you are um, a satisfied puppet and chef, puppet or chef user. I'm, not, I'm certainly not here to try and convince you to to uh, uh, switch over. Um, but Ansible does have its uh, very strong points, and I hope to be able to at least bring some of those across to you. Um, once upon a time, a long time ago, we had things like shell loops and shell scripts and so on, and then stuff got complicated. And by complicated, I mean basically. Um, we had software systems such as, for example, Puppet or Chef, which do a wonderful job, probably. Um, but we want to do things, uh, particularly we system administrators who have all sorts of stuff to do, um, um, we want to do things in an easy way. And what, what, uh, the way we want to do it, or the, uh, uh, yeah, basically the way we want to do it is as follows. I hear the cameraman is going to have a fit because I'm walking around now. But, um, now this is a, a trivial example, but I needed a trivial example to get it sort of in a single screenshot. Um, we have a file called hosts. Everybody see that little red dot on the top right? That is not slash etc host. It's not our host resolution uh, file. It's uh, uh, the um, in, I beg your pardon, Ansible inventory file, which by default is called hosts. It contains a list of host names in my environment. And I just append the host name to that. The host is called Kanga. And then I run a command called Ansible playbook and specify the name of a playbook. And this playbook basically is just a, a recipe of what this host uh, how system uh, configuration should be done on this host. Ansible then runs off and does things. And we see that there are two tasks that occur. Here's a task called install tmux package, and here's a task configure tmux. As I say, this is a trivial example, but basically goes for all. And for the host, Piglet, Roo, Poo, Eeyore, and Tigger, nothing happens. Those apparently have already been configured previously. In other words, this task, install tmux package, has already once uh, successfully run on those machines. But uh, we have our new host, Kanga, that has changed. And also the configuration has also changed for host Kanga upon running the task configure tmux. And at the end, we have a recap of what happened, the list of hosts that were accessed during this play, during this recipe, which failed, which were unreachable, et cetera, et cetera. So that's basically what I, I, would, I would like to see as, as, uh, as an easy method of system configuration. What Ansible gives us, or rather does not give us, we do not need uh, demons. We do not need agents. We do not need yet another PKI. We don't need a specific management host. Ansible management, I will probably often say the management host, doesn't need to be a dedicated machine. Could be a developer laptop, could be a system administrator laptop. Might be a central uh, machine where admins log on and from which they then do um, Ansible runs. What is also uh, not only possible, but very frequently done, is you have a group of system administrators who do certain tasks with Ansible, and you have a group of developers who do different tasks with Ansible. For example, deploy web pages or stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse me. We don't need uh, more open ports on our firewalls. We will reuse SSH. We don't need specific databases. Automation should not require programming experience, and it must be at least for most of us, that's what we desire. It must be easy, must, as of course defined in RFC 2119. Um, so, 
careful there's a, an, an explicit spelling mistake here. Uh, the whole result should be comprehensible or comprehensible. The French word comprehensible is not spelled that way. That's why I've, I've underlined it. So, welcome to Ansible. Ansible by default is push-based. From our management system, we will push out configuration, we will do orchestration in a push-based manner. But we can also configure Ansible to do pull mode, in other words, from a node, and I will be uh, showing you in a little moment how, to do, uh, how we can do that. Literally, we will be able to go from zero to production in minutes. No examples, many, many examples. People have downloaded an Ansible code, written a small playbook, and have done their first run within a few minutes. I'm not saying you can deploy your whole infrastructure uh, from zero in uh, five minutes, uh, but you will get first results in minutes compared to other systems which have a, a very much higher, um, uh, what is called learning curve, or much uh, higher investment in knowledge that is necessary to start with configuration management. The requirements for running Ansible are uh, relatively easy. Um, on the management node, I repeat, that is the machine from which we will be doing Ansible pushes. We require Python in version 2.6 with two modules. One is PyYAML. YAML stands for yet another markup language. That is a, a text language which we'll be using to describe Ansible playbooks, our recipes. And we need Jinja 2. Jinja 2 is a templating engine. Have anybody heard of Jinja 2 already? Most Python programmers probably will. On the nodes, we need, at the very least, Python 2.4. If you have Python 2.4, you also need the simple JSON module. If you have Python 2.5 or higher, um, you don't need any uh, additional modules. And those are the requirements. As you see, nothing uh, specific. So on the nodes that we're going to manage, just a simple Python installation suffices to do most Ansible things. Um, Ansible can run from a virtual environment. Ansible can run directly out of a Git checkout. Ansible can run directly after extracting a tar file. It does not need to be installed. It's very easy to test. Um, you can do the Ansible is also in pip, and then you can install it with easy install. And uh, there are uh, Ansible packages in most uh, Linux distributions available. But you don't have to do that. Many people actually run from bleeding edge Git. Uh, check out because they want the features that sort of keep popping up. Ansible uses SSH to connect to the nodes it is going to uh, manage. And uh, these SSH connections are handled either with um, keys, which is of course recommended, or with Kerberos, which is uh, recommended as well. And I, that's grayed out a little bit. I hope you can see that. Uh, you can also, if you don't have keys or you don't have Kerberos on your nodes, you can also use passwords. Of course, that I certainly do not recommend because that means every time you run Ansible, you have to type in passwords of the target systems. Ansible does not need to log in to uh, nodes it will manage as root. It can log in as any user. Um, the reason being, there are many um, organizations who do not allow root login. SSHD permit root login equals no. So Ansible does not require root uh, login to manage a remote system. But Ansible will probably, for many things, at least for many system administration tasks, will probably require root privileges. For example, package installation, adding or deleting users, things like that, require root privileges typically. Ansible can use sudo um, to do that with. Um, ideally, uh, passwordless sudo, if you're not allowed to do that, then uh, you will have to specify uh, sudo passwords to Ansible, which, is then, which it then uses. Uh, for anybody who's wondering, that picture at the bottom is a cake, large cake. I had that made as an apology because on a Friday afternoon, don't touch anything on Friday afternoons, on a Friday afternoon, somebody said, would you please add this to sudo and uh, to the sudoers file and distribute it? I said, yeah, sure. And I was on the way home from uh, Frankfurt back home. And uh, so I added a user, press enter, saved the file, and ran Ansible on 500 machines. Um, 
these are 500, uh, just over 500 machines that do not permit root login. So Ansible started going off and installed the sudo ors file and uh, then went on to the next system. And inside very few minutes, all these 500 boxes were, um, we had deployed a new sudo ors file onto these 500 boxes. Now, if you didn't know, if you have a syntax error in the sudo ors file, for example, a trailing comma, the next time sudo runs, it says, oh, there's a syntax error in this file, I refuse to do anything. Which is fine, if you know it. Um, so I deployed on 500 machines a sudo ors file with a syntax error in it. How do we fix that? Exactly, by hand. Certainly not with anything that requires sudo, because I could have run, fixed the file, the source template, and run Ansible again, but Ansible, first step would have been do a sudo to be able to copy the file over, and that sudo would have failed. So exactly, by hand. It was a very long Friday afternoon, and that cake was an, as, a, as a small apology to the, to the customer. So how does Ansible work? Ansible, we have on the left our so-called management node. As I say, that can be any, any laptop. We have our management node. Ansible has a whole bunch of modules. We'll be discussing some of these in a moment. Um, the playbooks we generate or we, we, we create, these playbooks are recipes of what Ansible should do on the target machines. And a hosts file, or what we uh, more generally call the inventory file. Ansible then connects via SSH in parallel to the nodes pushes itself over, respectively, a module over. The module does something, for example, copies a file or removes a file or creates a user, installs a package, removes a package, etc., or reboots a machine. And um, Ansible then cleans up after itself and returns. And these, these connections are parallelized up to a certain uh, point. I think default is uh, parallel of 10. Uh, if you want to do one machine after the other, you can, you can uh, reduce this, you can set serial equals one, and then it will hop over to the first machine, and then when that's complete, we'll hop over to the second machine. Which would be very useful, would have been very useful, in, for example, in the case of sudoors, then we would have broken at most one machine before noticing. Okay? And once again, very important, well, at least to me very important, and to many other people, no demons, no agents need installing on these nodes. Ansible is a very useful tool for doing ad hoc commands. Do, do something now. Reboot my web servers. Shut down my DNS servers. Whatever. It can install packages with apt, with yum, if you must, with zipper, um, with opkg for uh, other distributions, the Mac package manager, the all sorts of different package manager, all as, as modules. It has minimal com yeah, configuration language. This is the YAML description in which we describe the recipe, what we want to do. We don't need XML, we don't need Ruby know-how, etc. So relatively, all kept relatively simple. Any questions so far? You're welcome to interrupt at any time. Now, the inventory file of Ansible is an any type file, and it's by default it's called hosts. Uh, actually, the content of this variable. And this any type file has groups. In this uh, example, we have three groups. One is called local, one is called web servers, one is called dev servers. And uh, groups of machines contain host names or addresses. So for example, we have here in the group local, we have a host called 127.0.0.1. In the group web servers, we have www.example.com. And we have web 10 through web 23. We can specify slices. If you have a large range of machines, you don't have to enumerate them all. We can also have things like pseudo hosts. For example, this machine called Sushi, uh, which doesn't really exist. And we're telling Ansible with variables how to get there. So Ansible SSH host is 127.0.0.1. And Ansible SSH port is 2.2.2, so like a jump host. So we create quite a number of different uh, combinations. In this inventory file, in the static inventory file, we can also specify variables. Variables is one spot in which we can specify them. Variables which we will probably be using for something else. It's not, um, uh, we, we, we can't say at the moment what this variable is going to be used for, but it may be used. So for example, this machine, this host www.example.com, 
we're setting a variable called NTP to ntp1.pool.ntp.org, assuming that there's uh, a default perhaps for, for all the other machines. The Ansible inventory file, this hosts file, is by default static, but it need not be static. You can specify a directory, in which case Ansible will slurp in all the files in that directory and merge them into a single inventory. The, the, the um, inventory file you specify, so dollar Ansible hosts, can also be an executable. In the case it's an executable, um, Ansible will launch that to obtain a JSON data structure with a list of all hosts, all groups, and their variables. And that means we can have inventory, for example, uh, taken up, pulled out on the fly directly from our configuration management database, or from LDAP, from MySQL, from Cobbler, uh, EC2, OpenStack, for which there are already um, examples in the Ansible distribution. Or, of course, we can create our own, if you have some sort of newfangled thing, database kind of... Uh, uh, Excel sheet where you keep your host information, you could actually create an inventory file that would query that. I was kidding with the Excel. When we do something with Ansible, uh, when we run Ansible against a particular machine, either ad hoc or when we configure a playbook to do a certain amount of tasks, we specify targets, and there are a bunch of ways on how to specify targets. We can use target all, all, all hosts in our inventory. We can specify a group name, we can specify individual hosts, for example, separated by colons. We can negate something. So here, for example, web server, the group web servers, but not web 20. Yeah? So we can exclude uh, a number of hosts. That's well, relatively, a relatively flexible way of um, addressing the machines that we want to configure. As an example for an ad hoc copy, I said Ansible is useful for ad hoc situations. Somebody says, oh, let's quickly copy this file out. We don't have to create a recipe. We don't have to create a playbook for that. We can do it directly on the command line. And for that, the Ansible utility is used. And that Ansible utility gets a target specification. In this case, it's a, uh, a group. If you recall, let me just go back. If you recall, my group dev service has just one host in it, but it doesn't matter. It could have a hundred or a thousand machines in it. And we specify the name of a module and arguments to that module, and these arguments are passed in as one single parameter. Each module has um, its own arguments, its own mandatory or optional arguments. There's a utility called ansible-doc, which will, on the command line, um, tell you, like sort of a man page, give you the documentation of that module. Uh, this documentation, by the way, is, is extracted live from the module. Uh, that's a system that I wrote and created to, uh, crea uh, uh, donated to, to Ansible. Now, this copy module will copy a source file to a destination file. So we copy a source file to this destination file. Ansible then connects via SSH to the target system, copies this copy module over and a bit of itself. This module does something, in this case, it copies a file. And if it has to copy a file, it will, Ansible will also copy over, transfer over the source file into a temporary file name, which, by the way, we see here. This temporary file is, cre uh, is created by Ansible transparently. And what then happens in the case of copy, what then happens is an MD5 sum of, the, of this copy is taken compared with the MD5 sum of the final destination. If they differ, then the file is copied over. This allows Ansible modules, and most of them are, to be idempotent. What does idempotency mean? Anybody know? You can run something n times, the change will only occur once. For example, a SQL update command. Update table set value. You can run that n times, the update will only occur once. Um, Ansible then returns information on how this module succeeded, whether it succeeded, whether it failed, and error messages and so on. And what we see on the on standard out, when respectively standard error, when we run this, is something that looks a little bit like this. And this 
typically is hidden from us. We, normally, if we run it in a playbook, Ansible will hide that information from us because it's, uh, it's useless to see. The important thing here is success message, and that would cause Ansible then to carry on to the next, uh, to the next step. When we run Ansible in a playbook, it will, as part of its first operation, which we can um, disable if we want, but normally it's very useful, it will run what is called a setup module. And the setup module gathers information about the target node. These facts are brought back as a quite large data structure, which contain all sorts of information. This is just a tiny fragment, for space reasons. Um, there is data about uh, how much memory, how much swap space, how many interfaces, network interfaces, what um, v4, v6 addresses we have, routing information, whether it's of um, physical hardware, virtual hardware, um, host name, fully qualified DNS domain name, etc., etc. A whole amount of um, information that is returned. And these facts we can then use subsequently uh, to, for example, say, install this package if we are running on a rel type system, or uh, create this user if we're running on a Debian type system, etc. Um, these facts are uh, made available in Ansible playbooks as a variable. So if we later on want, for example, Ansible fully qualified domain name, we can use exactly that, Ansible underscore fully qualified domain name. If you want to see all the facts that are returned by the setup module, you can run that ad hoc. I'll go back for a second. Ansible machine minus M setup. You just run that setup module without parameters. If you have factor installed on the remote node, then that is also uh, launched and its result is merged into these facts of Ansible. If you have OHI installed, um, it also it too will be launched and its uh, result will uh, also be merged back into Ansible facts. Factor is uh, part of Puppet, OHI is part of Chef. If you're going to do Ansible, you probably have neither and I don't think you will really need them. At least, I don't know anybody who has ever explicitly installed those packages to run with Ansible. Ansible modules are um, bits of, uh, typically bits of Python, but they need not be Python. Ansible module can be created as a shell script. You can run Perl, you can run executable programs, anything. The module is copied over to the target machine and is executed there. Most modules in Ansible core are, as I said, Python. In fact, all of them are. And at last count, which was uh, yesterday morning, I think there were 220 plus modules. So this is just a very, very small selection and I've, I've highlighted a few for us. Um, we have, for example, command, which executes um, a program on the other side of the line. Ansible, command, shutdown. Command is not idempotent. For example, a reboot is not idempotent, obviously. No? Um, we have fetch, which retrieves a file or a tree of files. Get URL, which I happen to have written, obtains, uh, tells the remote system to get an FTP or an HTTP resource. Similar, the URI module, which should be somewhere here. Yeah, there. User to create or remove users. Groups, you can add, remove groups. There are modules for managing MySQL databases and, and access control lists, or Postgres, or RabbitMQ. Um, modules for notifications, such as mail, or MQTT, or IRC. You can, for example, at the end of a run, email a bunch of developers or system administrators that Ansible has completed. Um, very interesting if, and this mm, will probably happen to you at some point. If there's something you want to do on a remote node um, for which there is no module, you could either write a module, which is not particularly difficult, or if you think you can do it with a shell script or a Python script or a Perl script, whatever, you can run that through the script module. The script module takes a file, text file, transfers it to the other side, and runs an, interpre an, an interpreter on that, be it bin bash or be it user bin Python or uh, Perl, etc. So that's quite nice. 
who have modules for running uh, or for operating on SC Linux uh, variables, for example. A template module, which I'll talk about um, a bit more later on, or right now, actually. Um, so there's a, there's a very, very large number of modules, most of which are pretty well documented, um, and uh, also always with examples. And these modules um, allow us to do a set of operations on the other side. So let's have a look at a playbook. A playbook is a recipe of what we want to do on a node, how we want to configure it, what changes we want performed, and important, in which order. We specify the order, uh, which at the very least used to be almost impossible with uh, Puppet. I'm not sure if that's been changed in the meantime. Does anybody know, actually? Can I specify an order in Puppet? Only by dependency. Huh? That used to drive many people, including myself, absolutely nuts. Um, in Ansible, it's completely different. We, we specify exactly, do this, and then do this, and then do this, and if it fails, then stop. No? Um, so we use it for operating system configuration, for application deployment, um, yeah, for all sorts of, of things. And um, Ansible playbooks also support the notion of notification handlers. Suppose we wish to install a new version of Nginx, and and or change configuration. Now, on a remote node, this could either mean that Nginx is updated or that the configuration has changed if the package was still uh, in the, or was already in the correct version. Now, any one of those two things or even more, um, we can say, please, if you've updated the package and or if you've changed the configuration and or if you've created that user, then notify, um, notify Nginx restart. And this, handler for restarting Nginx will only be fired exactly once, irrespective of how often um, or how many uh, changes cause that handler to be fired. So let's look at this, um, at, a, at a playbook. Uh, here again, I'm picking up a little bit on that trivial example at the, at the beginning. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, this is a YAML file. Now, there, there are three no, two very, very difficult things, um, three very, very difficult things in YAML. One is it ought to start with three dashes. Um, it's not absolutely necessary, but that's what very often identifies YAML. Second of all, no tabs, no tabulator marks, just spaces, please. And then you will notice that we have here a dash that is introducing a list. And this list continues all the way down here. Just as here under tasks, we're also introducing a list. And there is list element zero, list element one, list element two. Okay, so that that's, uh, often causes pain that people in the editor don't sort of keep an eye on the on the left uh, column. Um, Ansible will tell you if the YAML is broken because the YAML parser is not able to read it. Um, yeah, it's it's not hard. It just gets a little bit, takes a little bit uh, taking use. So in the hosts key, we specify our targets. Any amount of all or dev servers or this box, but not that box, etc. Or any any amount of hosts we can specify. Then user, as which user do we want to log into the target machine? Default is I. And default is the user I'm logged in as. Do I want to run sudo on the other side? Yes or no. This is optional because in the case of here, we're going to install a package, so we need um, root privileges. But suppose you have a, a couple of developers who are pushing out changes to whatever, jars, web pages, etc. They might not require pseudo privileges on the target machine. Um, if the directory into which they're going to perform the changes or the files that they want to change belong to them anyway, then they can perfectly well use Ansible without you having to give them um, root privileges, which is very nice. Then we have a block here called vars. And here I've got a, I've defined, I'm defining a variable called edit mode. I'm setting it to the text vi. This variable edit mode is worth just as much or just as little as the variable ntp, which I hope you recall from the, um, in, from, from the inventory file. Okay? Just variables that are defined. This variable edit mode, let me just go back slightly, would be similar to one of these variables like Ansible fqdn, which come from the setup module. 
this is generated, and here it's specified. But same kind of text. So then we have a bunch of tasks, and a task has an optional name. This is what we would then see on the command line. Um, you recall from the uh, introductory screenshot, it said there, task installing Tmux package. Warning, if you have cowsay installed, you will see a whole bunch of cows mooing at you. Okay? The cowsay program will... Michael DeHaan, who's the original author of Ansible, is apparently very fond of cows. And um, if you have cowsay installed, you'll see little pictures of cows telling you this. You can disable that by setting an, uh, Ansible no cows equals true. You're welcome for that patch. Um, otherwise, you'll see just plain text. And, and then we have actions, and an action consists of a module name and arguments to that module. So the module is called yum, name is tmux, that's the name of the package. The state is installed, or state is removed, to remove a package if it exists, or state is latest. Yum should check whether there's an update for it, and if so, uh, implement it, etc. Then we have an action template with a source file and a destination file. We'll talk about this template in a second. And here we have another action, which does a shell command. Shell is like the command module, but supports the use of shell meta characters, star and uh, output redirection and so on. And here, this command is going to echo Ansible FQDN. That's one of those variables that came back from setup. And it's going to append it to slash temp slash list. Now, this action will not be executed on one of the hosts we're targeting it will be delegated to a different machine. This delegate to allows Ansible to, in its normal operation, we'll go to one machine, to the other machine, etc., to hop over to a completely foreign destination, which it won't be otherwise uh, managing, to tell it to do th things. For example, with the Nagios module, we could tell or instruct Nagios or Isinga to please deactivate alerts for this particular bunch of uh, for this particular machine that we're running on, because we know it's going to otherwise produce alerts. Another example would be we're going to upgrade Nginx or Apache on a bunch of hosts. Tell the load balancer to ignore these machines until we're ready. Yeah, so we can hop over to some other box and do something else. Quite powerful. So this template stuff is like is almost like a copy but it's processed by a templating engine. Um, I'll tell you about that in a second. And we have variables which come from the inventory file, our example is NTP, directly from playbooks, or from what are called group vars and host vars files. And group vars and host vars files are YAML files, an example on the bottom right here. YAML files, variable equals uh, variable colon, variable colon, variable colon. Um, which are located in the host underscore virus directory, respectively in the group underscore virus directory, and are picked up automatically by Ansible from host virus matched on hostname.yaml.yml or for uh, group virus matched by group.yml, automatically picked up and merged into whatever we already have. And a very powerful solution is from re the register keyword. Register allows us to run a task on a remote node and pick up, for example, its standard output and you register that as a variable and use that subsequently in playbooks. Yes, please. I beg your pardon? Is it overloaded? I was uh, afraid you were going to ask. Um, yes, they are replaced. Um, In this order, I think I'm not telling you a lie, in this order. So if you have, yeah, in this order. If you have a variable defined in the inventory and the same variable name in, for example, group virus file, the group virus file will, over, will overwrite what came from the inventory. Yeah? Whereas a host virus, uh, not in this order, sorry, wrong order. If you set admin, in group vars, you can overwrite that by the same variable name admin in host vars. Host vars will, will overwrite that. 
So templating allows us to copy over text files, configuration files, etc., and insert values. Now, what I'm going to show you here is, again, a trivial example. Um, consists of two parts. The top part is what I create as my source um, template, and the bottom part is what is going to actually be pushed out onto the remote node. So at the, at the beginning, we have a variable called ansible underscore managed, um, which we brought in uh, oh, quite a while back, or I think already in 1.1 or something. It's been around for a while, and I, but I wanted to have that. And ansible manage expands to something that looks a little bit like a warning or like information. So if somebody logs on to this machine and looks at this file, it will see, he, will, he or she will see this ansible managed file name, uh, modified on date by user on host. Uh, oh, yeah, I shouldn't touch this because it's going to be clobbered over by Ansible at the next run. Yeah. Is uh, an Ansible-managed I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that? If two people make the same change, will it change twice? If two people make the same change to the source file, Well, uh, no, if two... <laughs> well, uh, oh, I see. Uh, it's not the... Per okay, sorry. It's not the person who changed it. This here is the owner of the, the file owner on the management host. The file can only belong to one person. Okay, the, if you do an ls minus l on the management host, you would see belongs to JPM. That's, that's the name. And if two people change that file, at, uh, well, not at the same time as impossible, but after each other, it depends when Ansible runs. When Ansible runs, you would see a timestamp either of the first change or of the second change, depending when that run comes. Okay? Have I answered your question? Yeah. This is not the variable from a, from a version control system or something. It's the file owner. Yeah? If you don't like this format, you can change it. That, that variable is configurable. The format is configurable. So, then we have, for example, here, this is a Jinja2 comment. This does not show up at all here. It's completely silently ignored. And the rest is just text, which is copied over, um, except for our variable edit mode, which is replaced into whatever the, uh, that variable is currently set to. Okay? Now, this is a little bit of a trivial example, but we have uh, all sorts of things we can do with uh, templates. When Ansible runs on... Um, on a bunch of remote nodes. It collects all the setup facts into a big, gigantic variable called host vars. And we can run through this. I'm not going to dissect this for you, but what this uh, snippet at the top basically does is, for all the machines that Ansible has visited during this run, it will create like a slash etc slash host format file. So you, we, we iterate through these host vars and grab Ansible Ethernet Zero interface and the IPv4 address of that and replace it by the Ansible host name, uh, sorry, not replace, but um, uh, output Ansible host name and, uh, and the key. So the result is list of IP addresses, fully qualified domain name and short name, yeah? like an ETC host file. Not that this is practical, but what I wanted to de demonstrate, uh, because I hope you don't particularly use ETC hosts, um, but I wanted to demonstrate that um, um, that these Jinja2 templates within Ansible can become rather powerful. You can, in a template, for example, you can access variables of a different host. So, if, very interesting when you're um, creating Isinga uh, configurations where you need information about hosts that you're visiting. We're visiting that and that host, and you delegate over and you create a template for Isinga or for Nagios or whatever, which contains information about those hosts, IP addresses, names, etc. Yeah. So you can do quite, quite nice things with that. This basically uh, could be comparable to um, Puppet calls it, not PuppetDB, what, ca what came before PuppetDB? You know what I mean, no? Where Puppet keeps all its variables. Sorry, I forgot the name. Anybody know what it's called? Um, so, dollar lookup is a special variable. Dollar lookup allows us to look up uh, information at runtime from Redis, from DNS text records, out of comma separated values. If you have, uh, for example, lists of things that you want to 
uh, that you want to insert at runtime from a Redis database, um, for example, you can do that with dollar lookup in a template or in a playbook. Now we spoke, I spoke earlier about delegation. We had that example where we hop over and uh, do something on a load balancer and do something on Nagios. Um, this is exactly what happens. Uh, the Ansible management node goes over to our host and does things, and we can, we can make it hop over to a different node, like a node balancer, like an async, uh, asynchro machine, any, any other kind of host, to do certain things based on facts, based on information that we are um, getting back from the nodes that we are actually trying to configure here on the right. I mentioned earlier uh, Ansible is by default push mode, but we can also make it do pull uh, configurations. Um, in order to be able to do that, we need a full Ansible installation on the nodes. So these nodes, they would be doing the pull, but that means, of course, that they must be full Ansible hosts. So they need Ansible installation, they need the requirements for Ansible, Python 2.5 and the PyYAML and uh, Jinja 2 modules. And then basically, there's no, no real magic, what, what basically happens is you provide configuration in form from playbooks, etc. You provide in files which you might replicate over a repos Git repository or some other version control system. These nodes have access to that repository and then they run their playbooks on localhost. So they don't connect to themselves via SSH, they connect via a, what is called a local connection on themselves. The advantage is all the advantages of pull mode, so you don't have to push. Hosts can, for example, configure themselves when they come up after a reboot. The disadvantage, in my uh, opinion, is um, these nodes need a full Ansible installation. Yeah? Um, I said Ansible connects via SSH to machines. This is only partially true. It, uh, by default, it connects via SSH to machines, but we've just now seen in local, it can also connect via loopback to, the, uh, to uh, via uh, what is called a local connection to um, itself. And there are a number of other modules, and one of which is called Fireball. Now, this is no longer very interesting, but I love that Fireball, that's why I left it in. Uh, Fireball is, um, still works, um, is a method of, of uh, very greatly speeding up Ansible runs. Um, what actually happens with Fireball is Ansible sets up a zero MQ socket between management node and uh, managed node and pumps everything over that, which is of course very, or used to be, very, very much faster than using SSH. Meanwhile, this has lost a little bit of attractiveness because, first of all, this Fireball mode requires uh, quite a bit of software on all nodes. 0MQ and the Python modules and the encryption modules and so on. And the second reason is the Ansible SSH um, uh, connection has been uh, in 1.5, I think it was in version 1 Ansible version 1.5, has been very, very greatly improved upon. And the speed doesn't come, it's not like using 0MQ, but it comes almost close. So, roles. Roles are like mini playbooks which we can um, include into other playbooks. Here at the top, we have a directory called roles, and in there I have a directory called engine x. This is to be a role name. And we can have any a number of optional directories and files in there, and these together, this collection here together, becomes a role. Now, if there is a file main.yaml in the subdirectory tasks, then those are the tasks that will be applied in this role. If there are no tasks for the role, the role won't, have, won't do anything, it will be pretty much useless. If there is a main.yaml in a directory vars, then those variables from main.yaml will be loaded into that role. And these roles, here in this case engine x, we can specify in our playbooks. Here's our playbook again, hosts, our targets, roles, engine X, for example, MySQL. We can have a role app, which is parameterized. It gets uh, parameters passed to it. And then we can have additional tasks. So roles are like m a mini miniature playbook 
uh, which can be included by uh, other playbooks. The advantage also of a role is templates or files that we copy from a role are relative to that role's directory. So, for example, if in a role you say copy this file to that destination, you don't have to muck about with path names, you just say copy file name, and that file name by default is searched for in this subdirectory. Okay, that makes creating uh, roles very much, uh, very much easier, and it makes it um, very much easier to, uh, to share roles. Ansible Vault is new since version 1.5, um, and Ansible Vault allows us to encrypt YAML files, be it playbooks, which is probably not terribly interesting, I would say, but uh, what could be very interesting, uh, uh, encrypt YAML files uh, which contain variables, for example, passwords, clear text passwords for MySQL or clear text passwords for RabbitMQ or special usernames. We can create these and keep them encrypted. We can even store them in our repository because they are encrypted. And at runtime, Ansible will ask us for a password and push that out. Now, the way this works is with the Ansible Vault command. Ansible Vault create file name. Ansible Vault will ask you for a password twice, which you then please do not forget, and will then drop you into an editor. And in that editor, you create whatever text you like, YAML, etc. As soon as you save that file and exit the editor, Ansible Vault takes the content of that clear text, encrypts it, and puts it on the file system with a magic marker in it, which uh, demonstrates that it is, so that Ansible knows the next time it picks up that file, that the file is encrypted. When we then run, let's suppose we're running, uh, let's suppose this is a playbook we're doing here. When we then run Ansible playbook on that file, it says, sorry, I can't do much about it because it's encrypted. We need the, the password. So Ansible playbook minus minus ask vault pass will ask you for the vault password word. Ansible will then decrypt this file from the vault and we'll start operating on it. Okay. There was a f feature which, was, uh, which has been requested for a long time. Um, this is one way of doing it. Um, there are other ways of doing it. Um, yeah. Now a little bit uh, more in depth. Ansible allows us to embed it completely in our own apps. Um, anybody? Who, who does Python? Oh, quite a lot. You can, um, this is just a trivial example, I won't go into this very much, but by importing ansible.runner and making ansible run on a pattern, this is a, you probably recognize this from my inventory, this is a bunch of host names, module name command, module arguments uptime, and we're actually embedding ansible completely in our own application. And we can then run this, um, sorry, here, run this, Ansible goes off, does whatever it's supposed to do, according to what we specified, and returns results. And these results are returned in a data structure. Here we're targeting only one host, but we see, for example, dark hosts, hosts that could not be reached, contacted hosts. And if you look here, you have the command, user bin uptime, which is what is happening. And here is the standard out returned from that program. And this standard out, we could then, over a bunch of hosts, use to graph or to show display in a different way. So we can embed Ansible and all its capabilities, its inventory use, etc., and its connection mechanisms, its pseudo mechanisms, etc., into our own apps, which is quite, uh, quite nice. Ansible is extensible. We can write modules, as I mentioned earlier, in Python, in Bash, in anything. Remember, please, when you're writing a module, for example, suppose your, your preferred language is Perl, you can easily write a module in Perl, but Ansible copies that module over to the remote system, to the remote node. So that module must be executable there. If you count on a particular Perl version, that Perl version must exist on the node, otherwise the module cannot work. Also, if you have Perl with a particular bunch of modules, that Perl modules that you're using, those modules must have previously been installed there, otherwise that module cannot be executed. 
You could easily install those with an using Ansible, but it has to be done. Uh, modules could also be compiled programs, uh, as long as the architecture matches. We have action plugins. Action plugins are um, things that we can embed into Ansible, to, which are um, invoked on every task or in every play. We have different data sources, for example, for inventory sources, which can be done in any language, as long as they return JSON as described in the Ansible documentation. Um, something which is relatively new is a project called Ansible Galaxy, which belongs to Ansible, or is part of Ansible. Ansible Galaxy is a, is a collection of, re of, hopefully, reusable roles. People create a role for installing Nginx, or for installing Apache, or for doing this, for installing Postfix, etc. And they, you can, pr you can uh, upload this to Ansible Galaxy. And that allows me, as a potential user of that role, with the new command Ansible Galaxy, to just simply, simply download that role and start using it. Yeah. I think so far there must be about 400 roles on Ansible Galaxy. Um, and there's a voting system, you can rate them whether they're good or not good, etc. Not quite, quite interesting. So, that basically uh, concludes our, my small introduction into Ansible. Uh, Ansible is supposed to give us, yeah, bit, us administrators, system administrators, a bit more time for, uh, for doing things, for, um, uh, for, yeah, for, get, for getting things done. Ansible.com or at Ansible is the place to go to for documentation, for updates, etc. And, um, it's worth it. If you've never done system configuration management, then I personally highly recommend uh, Ansible as at least a way of getting started. Any questions? Yes. yes. Uh, do you actually know of people uh, using Ansible together with Puppet? Yes. Uh, um, it's a frightening number of people who do that because <laughs> no, I say frightening because because I wouldn't have expected that. Um, Puppet is grand. Period. Um, next paragraph. But uh, there, there's a bunch of stuff missing in Puppet, and um, the, I know people who come up to me after conference say, "Oh, this is fantastic because we, for example, want to run ad hoc commands. We want to say reboot now, and we can't do that in Puppet." Yeah. So there's a, there's, a, there's a large number of people who have been using utilities like Funk, for example. Funk is, I, if I recall correctly, also by Michael Dehan, at least he had his fingers on it. Funk allows you to do stuff like that. But, uh, so they say, oh, this is grand, because we have an SSH infrastructure anyway. So we just get Ansible, and within literally 30 seconds, we start rebooting our servers or copying files, etc., doing these ad hoc things. And... Um, but careful, um, let me warn you, it's addictive. Um, and I know uh, people who have come back to me uh, half a year, a year later, and said, you shouldn't have told us that because um, we got rid of Puppet. But okay, that probably won't happen to you. So yes, there are uh, a large number of people who are using Ansible um, with, well, not, yeah, with, in parallel to Puppet, to, to be able to do things that Puppet only very difficultly does. Do you still hear me? Something connect. Okay. Yeah? Um, Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, I got a question. Um, I, have, I had a look for the ad hoc commands at Rundeck, and Rundeck is good, but it doesn't work with uh, SSH keys with passwords. Is Ansible working with SSH keys, which has passwords, or with SSH keys uh, loaded into SSH agent? Well, with SSH keys loaded into SSH agent, yes, of course, ab absolutely. I must say, I, I honestly don't know if you run Ansible with an SSH key that is not in your agent. In other words, if you have no agent running, for example. No? I, don't, I honestly don't know what's going to happen. Um, I seem to recall some discussion that that was added, but I've never tested it myself. I think Ansible will prompt you for the key password. But that's not the way you want to do it. 
I mean, you know why it's not the way you want to do it because every, it's like using pseudo passwords or, or pa because that means every time you run Ansible, you will be prompted for password. Um, it's so trivial to run an agent, even if if you if if your main if you, I mean, one shouldn't really say this in a Unix shop, but uh, if, even if you use Windows as a client uh, with Putty answer, you can you can run its agent and Ansible will very gladly query that. You probably know that. So. Um, Keys added to agent, yeah, of course. Ansible doesn't know about it. It just launches SSH and off it goes. Keys that have not been, uh, keys with passphrases on them which have not been loaded into an agent ought to work. I don't know if they do. Okay? Do we have another? Yeah. Uh, how powerful is this uh, host selection? So if you say all web servers, but not the web servers with NTP host with a variable and key, so can you, can you filter no. on the keys? No. Yes. Um, you can filter, well, filter. You, you, can, you, can select, you can select groups, you can select um, lists of hosts, you can exclude groups with an uh, exclamation mark, you can exclude uh, slices, so not web bracket open, 11 to 13, um, you cannot uh, filter on, on variables. The reason you cannot filter on variables is, is a purely technical reason. One of the very first thing Ansible does after loading the playbook, after loading the YAML of the playbook, is it launches the inventory. So, um, and at that moment, not all variables are known because some variables might come out of group virus or host virus files. So it just cannot. If you needed something similar, you would probably have to have to wrap that into your own inventory program, uh, which you feed from a database and so on, and, and then say, okay, let, I'll feed that into Ansible and have some way of specifying not hosts that already have an NTP uh, host name set. Yeah? That is currently not possible. Uh, it's unlikely that that will come, but yeah. Inventory is a, big, is a huge topic. There are a bunch of people working on inventory. Inventory in Ansible, Particularly, dynamic inventory is a little bit uh, is a little bit slow because of the way it works. It first slurps in the list of hosts, and then it has to go back to the inventory to query each host for for potential variables that come in. So there's a lot of um, possible improvement. I'm not saying it doesn't work. On the contrary, it works very well. But there's there's a lot of room for improvement in performance on inventory. And I know a chap called Serge um, uh, van Gendarte, who's, who's who's investing a lot of time and effort in, in trying to optimize that a bit. And if you configure a web server, which is called web servers, what happens? If the group name is the same as the host name, does it break or does it behave weird and you do not know about it or? Well, I wouldn't do that, but um, <laughs> that's not the answer you want. I, I, I cannot answer your question. Um, yes, I can answer your question. Uh, it will work as, speci as you think it would, but if you, for example, have a group web server with a host web server and a host mail server together in that group, if you target web server, what do you want? You're going to get the group, but if you just wanted the host, that's your problem. Okay? So you would then have to target web server and not mail server. Then you get what you want. Don't do it. Yeah, don't do it, please. Um, regarding this question, maybe uh, one important information is that you can skip tasks. So the inventory happened, so that the host is on the list, but you can say, okay, if this is a Red Hat OS or something like that, uh, skip it. Correct. Skip if, this. If you look, if we look at, uh, sorry, uh, here. If we look at this, uh, no, let's go here. Beg your pardon. There. If we look at this playbook, there's. I've shown you here actions or delegate to. There's all sorts of things like, for example, delegate to local. It's a local action. There's things like conditionals. You can add uh, lists of items. You can say, um, do this task, but only when Ansible um, architecture is i386, etc. There's a whole bunch of things. So, yeah, very valuable point. And you can also skip based on host names, based on any fact that is returned from the Ansible inventory, uh, from the Ansible uh, setup phase. Yeah, correct. Thank you. One more question. Uh, yeah. Uh, so regarding package management, so um, I looked at the Ansible documentation, and there is some kind of abstraction regarding services. 
So I can say I want this service to be on, enabled, and starting. Uh, and it doesn't care if it's OpenRC or systemd and so on. But I looked at the package management part, and there is no such thing as abstraction. So Correct. Like in your playbook, you have yum name tmux, but if I'm on SUSE, I'm fucked. Well, I wouldn't have used that last word in this particular case, although in combination with SUSE, anyway. Um, uh, that is correct. The, that was an architectural decision that was taken way back when. Um, Puppet, uh, for example, and I assume Chef also, I'm not sure, Puppet abstracts that for you. In Puppet, you say install a package, and Puppet will do the magic that is, will hopefully do the magic that is required on that particular platform. Um, when Ansible started, they decided, the, the guys who started this, in, uh, in particular Mr. Michael Dehan, uh, decided no, w we don't want that because we basically have to know what kind of, we administrators who are doing this stuff, we basically, not even basically, we have to know what target we're, we're accessing anyway. Because, for example, things like config files are in different locations. Package names are different. The worst thing that ever, ever happened in Linux, in my opinion. Um, package names are different. Architecture is different. So let's go the whole way and also separate out um, package management hoping to, to be able to implement package management as, as well as possible for the, for, the, uh, for, the, for the target, for the distribution. That is the reason. At the beginning, many people say, oh, it looks very strange, but people get used to it. We experience many locations that have, have for example, only Debian. We, have, we know very many uh, places that have only CentOS or RHEL, yeah? or Fedora, but that's all yum. Um, those people don't mind at all. If you're, in a <laughs> if you're in a position, like, by the way, I am, to require APT and, or apt and yum and even zipper, um, that's why I'm so old, um, that is really, <sighs> yeah, trivial to manage, okay? So yeah, it looks strange, but that's the way it is, okay? Quick question. Quick. So basically, although I'm not hungry, uh, we can stay if you like. All right. <laughs> uh, so basically, in in Puppet, you write one module and you cover the the operation system thingies in the module. Like uh, if I'm on Red Hat, use YAM. If not, use whatever else. Uh, in Ansible, you would write two modules. Well, not modules. Uh, I think what you mean is playbook. Um, okay. Uh, a, mod a module is the thing that goes over to do something. So we have a module called APT and we have a module called YUM. That's the stuff that Ansible uses to do stuff on the remote. What you probably mean is a playbook. So in, in Ansible, you would either have two different playbooks, one for Debian and one for RHEL type systems, or you combine it. For example, you can say um, action YUM when Ansible distribution is uh, RHEL, and, act, and, and another one, action APT, when Ansible distribution is Debian. So since this when will not occur, that step will just be ignored. So you can have one playbook targeting different flavors of Unix, uh, Linux distributions. So that playbook could be like install and configure Postgres? Uh, the configuration part will probably be identical. Except, except yes. path for path names. Path names you can hide in variables. Yeah? Um, the, the package name might be different, or will probably be different, and certainly the, the, the package command will be different. So that you would hide, and the rest is the same, irrespective of what flavor you're targeting. Okay. Yeah? Thanks. Good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I understand um, there's a buffet upstairs. So, yeah, let's go get it. Thank you very much.